Good morning. I am Suzanne Lawson with Constellation Consulting, and we are pleased to present the 2020 New Mexico Summit on Health Equity Virtual Series. This series is funded by the New Mexico Department of Health Tobacco Use Prevention and Control Program and will take place each Thursday through June 25th. For more information about the summit and our upcoming presentations, please visit our website at nmhealthequity.org. While originally intended to be an in-person summit to address health equity within the live, work, play model, the 2020 New Mexico Summit on Health Equity became a virtual series this year due to COVID-19. We appreciate the efforts of everyone involved in transitioning this event online, including our presenters, the Department of Health, Alliance Audiovisual, and the members of our Constellation Consulting team. For Zoom security reasons, for today's session, we are utilizing the Zoom webinar feature and attendees' webcams and microphones have been disabled. If you would like to introduce yourself and engage with other attendees today, please feel free to do so in the chat feature. If you have questions for today's presenter, please use the Q&A function and we will address as many questions as time allows at the end of today's presentation. Any materials provided by today's presenter will be posted on our website. You can also access a recording of today's presentation along with recordings of our past sessions at nmhealthequity.org. Following today's session, you will, receive an uh, you will receive an email with a link to an online evaluation. We encourage everyone to take the evaluation and if you would, like, if you would also like to receive community health worker or social worker CEUs or continuing medica medical education units, you must complete this evaluation. CEU certificates will be emailed out within 30 days of completion of the evaluation. This year, we are also excited to offer you all an additional way to engage and connect with others participating in this year's Summit on Health Equity Virtual Series. As an illustration of our continued growth as a community, we invite you to participate in our virtual mosaic. This mosaic will be built over the next several weeks and will be made up of photos you send in to us. You can send in one photo or several. They can be a view, a view with those that you may be with during this time, or even images that you find that are inspired by this week's presentation. To be part of this, please send your pictures and images via email to info at constellationnm.com with the subject mosaic. The mosaic is currently live at www.nmhealthequity.org and we will continue adding photos each week. And finally, before we begin today, on behalf of Constellation Consulting, racism has no place in our communities. We are New Mexico and we were built strong by the diverse people of our communities. Today and every day, we stand with our black colleagues, partners, collaborators, and the entire black community. We stand with our black public health allies around our state, country, and the globe to speak out against racism and to promote understanding to build a better, better world for us all. Today, we are excited to host Dr. Nancy Lopez as our third presenter in the Summit on Health Equity Virtual Series. Dr. Lopez is Professor of Sociology at the University of New Mexico. She directs and co-founded the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Justice, and is the founding coordinator of the New Mexico Statewide Race, Gender, Class, Data Policy Consortium. Dr. Lopez's scholarship, teaching, and service is guided by the insights of intersectionality, the importance of examining the simultaneity of oppression and resistance as visible in the dynamics of systems of inequality across a variety of social outcomes including education, health, employment, housing, and developing contextualized solutions that advance social justice. You can read her complete bio on our website at nmhealthequity.org. Please welcome Dr. Nancy Lopez. Thank you, Suzanne. Buenos dias, buenas tardes, familia, almost. It's 11.30, I know. I'm going to go ahead and um, continue by sharing my screen and sharing um, some slides that will help us think about how data contextualizes how we play in New Mexico and the value added by a critical race and intersectional lens for social justice inquiry and praxis. Um, I also want to start by um, 
acknowledging that we stand on indigenous land. And I encourage you to look at an article by Tuck and Yang that talks about decolonization is not a metaphor. How do we walk the talk? So I want us to think about the 2020 census is going to be a larger part of my conversation today and why critical race theory and intersectionality are important when looking at something like response rates. So I want to share this uh, map that I just copied la late last night from the website listed at the bottom of this slide that shows what the response rate is not only in the country for the 2020 census, which as you know, um, is going to be extended until October 31st, the collection time. So for the entire country, it's 60%. For New the state of New Mexico, it's 48% have filled out their census. And for Albuquerque, it says 64%. Now that sounds like it's you know better than average, but when we look a little bit deeper and we look at census tracts, and when we look at what neighborhoods are having uh, response rates of 80 to 90% versus which neighborhoods have response rates of 40 to 30%, we see that it actually maps on to um, communities that have traditionally been underrepresented, not only um, Hispanic, Native, Black communities, Asian and immigrant communities, but also low income. So I urge you to always think about when you're looking at numbers that are giving you averages to dig a little deeper, contextualize that data to help you understand who's missing here or what other story is not being told. And I ask at the bottom of this slide, why aren't response rates available real time by race and ethnicity? I also note that 18% of our households have not even received the census form. So we are um, lagging behind the national average, but a lot of that has to do with the fact that because many um, residences are rural and they only have post office boxes, they haven't actually received the form yet. So at about 18%. This is um, another invitation for you to think critically about race and what it means. Is it DNA? Is it ethnicity? Is it a relationship of power? What is your street race? How do lived experiences and relationships of power shape your reality of what identity is and what it means and what the consequence is, right? I also want you to think very deeply about what is your racial conceptualization, your ontology, the way you think about race, what ideas and concepts were you taught in school or maybe in your family or maybe through work? Um, where do those ideas come from? And I will argue that race or color or the meanings that are assigned not only to your color but also your facial features, your hair texture and so on is not the same as ethnicity, it's certainly not the same as uh, nationality or DNA, race, street race, I call it, like gender, is a master social status, a position in society that, like gender, often overpowers all others in a given circum uh, circumstance. So conversation goals, again, using critical race theory and intersectionality, I will be talking about the politics of how that race question is answered. I will also talk about some research that I've done in health and I want you to think about what are the racialized and gendered social determinants of health. We think about education, we think about um, housing, we think about um, occupational status, all those things, and how we could use that lens to understand why the communities that are most disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 right now, but it could be any other um, major um, crisis are, are having the outcomes that they are. What are the social determinants of that? And then finally, I'll end with a conversation and sharing some research that I've done looking at um, inequities in higher ed and how can we improve the definition of at-risk student for the New Mexico funding formula. And really what I would love for you to think about is what are your spheres of influence for social justice? What are three things that you could do, that you could influence, maybe change the conversation, maybe consider alternatives to what the status quo is, whether you're working in health or in education or housing or whatever it may be. Um, before we start a conversation, I always like to put together some provocative questions. So the first one I'll put is, are we a post-racial society? 
who benefits when our data collection is power and color evasive? And what could ethical data collection look like? Um, should we use one question to measure two concepts, race and origin? What, would you measure gender and sexual orientation with one question? What about educational attainment and occupational status? What about income and wealth? What is the census afraid of? We need ethical accuracy for social justice, not aesthetic accuracy for compliance only, right? Why should we mark only one box when we're answering the race question? Would it be useful to think about race as a social status that is not the same as culture, language, origin, ethnicity, ancestry, nationality, or DNA? And the last question really refers to the conversation I'll have on higher ed, which says, should we use class as a proxy for race and gender equity? Should PAL status be used as a proxy for at risk? What about zip code? I'm sure you've heard that right now, the SAT um, standardized exam is considering using zip code as a proxy for disadvantage. How is that contributing to colorblind racism? Here, I'll point out that um, I've been thinking and talking about these issues for a long time. So there's an article uh, essay that I published in the conversation.com a couple of years ago that has about 54,000 downloads. And the question that I pose there is, why is the census continually confusing race and ethnicity? Is that an accident or what's, what's going on, right? And then of course, ask the question, if you were walking down the street, what race do you think others who don't know you would automatically assume you were based on what you look like, which is what I'm arguing we are trying to capture, right? So I, I draw on a lot of um, frameworks from sociology. One of them is called racial formation theory. And this is a very important framework that helps us understand that race is a social construction that is visible at multiple levels, but that it also contains a visual dimension that corporeal distinctions are common, skin color, physical build, hair texture, the structure of cheekbones, the shape of the nose, all of those things make a very big difference. I also show this image to show why it's important never to confuse ethnicity what cultural background you might come from, particularly for Hispanic groups, with race. You see these very handsome and famous men who um, are all Latinx, they're all Hispanic. They are all coming from very distinct backgrounds that um, represent people in my own family. And if they all just marked, hey, I'm Puerto Rican, I'm Dominican, I'm Mexican, I'm uh, Salvadorian, and didn't check that race box, we would have no ability to find out who might have a, a different experience when they go look for housing, when they look for employment, when they interact with immigration officials, when um, they uh, interact with law officials, et cetera. So I do argue that the family members of the same eth ethnic group should answer that question differently to reflect their unique racial social status, right? Not DNA, but what is their, um, the meanings attributed to their physical appearance. And so here, you'll, you'll know that most of these guidelines are set um, by the Office of Management and Budget. Um, and these are the standards that they created um, it, originally in the 1970s, but updated in 1997. And why do you think that OMB is flattening the difference between origin and race? Think about what was happening when in the 1970s, the first iteration of these um, guidelines came out. Think about the political context, right? The civil rights movement, the Civil Rights Act. And then by the 1970s, there was a backlash. So you'll see over here that it says um, that a black person is a person having origins in any of the black groups of Africa. A Hispanic or Latino is a person of Cuban, Mexican, Puerto Rican, uh, South or Central American, other Spanish culture or origin. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Why, why are we confusing origin with race? Is, that re is geography race? So that's a good question for us to think about. For those of you who filled out the census, you already saw these questions. And um, it, there was a debate about whether or not they were going to combine the Hispanic origin and the race question. And in the end, they kept them separate. However, there was a major change that is extremely problematic. And that major change is that for the first time in the history of the census, 
we are actually linking and giving suggested nationalities or origins under each box. And on the face of it, it sounds like, well, that's simply, you know, innocuous. It has no consequence, but it absolutely does. So I ask um, census designers at many of the forum that I've participated with um, them, you know, what box would you put Canadian? What about South African? What about American? Linking race to nationality is the definition, definition of racism. And what they'll say is, well, OMB standards um, dictate what um, national origins we have to put by each box. But when I ask what will happen when multiple people check all these boxes, how will that help us understand um, civil rights violations when you go vote, when you go seek um, health care, when you seek fair housing? Who benefits when we don't have good data? Are we post-racial? Why is the census asking about three different concepts in one question? Those are all issues that I think beg the question, is this something that's happening by accident or is it intentional? So I invite you to visit this website. Um, it's fascinating from a sociological perspective, but from many other perspectives. Um, the website's at the bottom. It's called the Census Academy and they have webinars that are recorded. And I will show you a few slides that come from this webinar that shows why, how you mark that race question is incredibly important for social justice, right? So um, the first slide shows you what happens now under this new format that has never happened before in the history of our country, where they're suggesting, you know, nationalities by each race box or origins by each race box. What happens when this person who says, yes, I am Hispanic and I'm checking I'm white and I'm writing Latino and I'm checking I'm native and I'm writing Mexican and I'm checking Salvadorian and uh, I mean uh, some other race and writing Salvadorian. Well, according to the webinar, and you can all watch it, it says that th that person will be classified as marking some other race. Some other race then gets reclassified according to some algorithm that's created. So again, when you mark multiple boxes, it is very unclear what is going to happen. And a lot of that discretion happens at the level of the state, but it could happen at the level of the Department of Health, where decisions could be made to include or um, exclude people uh, in a given race box for civil rights purposes. So I urge you to think about what would happen with this data here in New Mexico or in any other city like New York City where I was born and raised, what, how will this count? The other example is, um, that they mentioned is a Hispanic person who says, yes, I'm Hispanic and they write Cuban, but then um, they also check in the race box, I'm black. They do affirm that that person will be considered black. So that, for instance, in New York City, most of the Latinos or a good percentage of them are like me, black Latinos, in my case, I'm Dominican. And that would allow us to understand if those of our cousins that look very white and walking down the street, they would not necessarily be associated with blackness, are living in the same kinds of neighborhoods or experiencing um, fair housing the same way that black Dominicans or black Cubans are. So checking one box might help us understand if poverty rates are different, right? All these things that we care about. Now, they mentioned that in this case, this person is indicating that they're white and Lebanese, Egyptian and Syrian, and then at the very bottom, they check some other race and put in Moroccan. This person would be um, not counted as, again, any of this. It would be considered non-response because they're not necessarily checking one box. So again, I keep urging you to think about what happens when you check multiple boxes and what happens if walking down the street, this person probably would be identified as brown. Why isn't there a brown category? Because if we're trying to figure out racialization and we're trying to figure out if the experiences of Lebanese or Egyptians or Syrians or Moroccans who are lighter skinned or brown or black looking or maybe even so-called Asian looking are experiencing something different in terms of civil rights, why are we not capturing that reality? And this was the most interesting slide that I found from that webinar. And it's one that suggested that the person 
who says, no, I'm not Hispanic, and then checks, I'm black, and writes in Egyptian will automatically be recoded as saying, I am black and white, because according to OMB standards, Egypt, Northern Africa, Morocco is white. Now, you tell me if that is respecting the choice of this individual. I ask myself that every day. I said, is this aesthetic accuracy, meaning we're just going to reinterpret this um, response and call it um, this person really wanted to say that they were white? Or is it authentic accuracy, an accuracy that's really tied to civil rights use? So again, we worry that there is going to be an undercount, as you know, for so many reasons, not only COVID, but before that, there was the, t the attempt to put a citizenship question, and there's a lot of fear in communities, particularly immigrant communities, but we also need to worry that there is an undercount of good race data that would help us understand outcomes in terms of the color line. So um, this is a, mod uh, a figure that I use to describe how race is multifaceted that for the most part, most of the data we collect, whether you are checking into a hospital or applying for work or school, is just asking, hey, how do you identify? What community do you feel connected to? Um, uh, what is your you know, background? That's an important question. I'm not saying we don't need to ask it, but if we only stop there, then we're missing the opportunity to understand racialization because it may be the case that how you identify is how others see you, but in many cases that is not the case. So we also need to ask about ascribed race. We need to ask about street race. Should that be an ethical standard? That's on the right-hand side. The bottom circle talks about lived experience. What are the everyday experiences that you may have based on how people see you? So capturing when you go and um, uh, try to find um, an apartment or when you go into a store are people following you or do people automatically assume that you don't belong in your place of work because people like you don't work there all those kinds of things are things that we need to capture and tribal status uh, political status is not equivalent to race it's not the same as your what you look like it is a different dimension so we need a different question for that so think about in your own workplace are we capturing all those dimensions of race I also want us to think about the importance of ethnicity. Obviously, we need to know about the origins, the culture, the ancestry, the generational status if you come from an immigrant background, um, whether or not you experience citizenship privilege, right? Or um, whether or not you're undocumented. Those are all um, information that helps us advance health equity in a way that doesn't put anyone in jeopardy. We would not be asking those questions if we um, believe that it will um, impede access to health care or um, work, but being aware that that, that that is an inequity. Primary language, right? Do we have translators? So I mentioned that I'm the daughter, the U.S. born daughter, New York City born daughter of Dominican immigrants. My parents came as adults. Accessing health care for them means they need to have, even though they may understand some English, that's not their first language, right? And especially with medical terms. So are we providing equitable opportunities? Are we collecting data on that? Um, what about the food ways, the, cu the culture, the uh, religion, the, um, the uh, practices? All of those things are important. I often get this question almost at every um, presentation I give, but I'm mixed race. What should I mark? Shouldn't I mark the five boxes? And I tell you, um, when you look at these two very beautiful women who are also mixed race, um, if they marked all the boxes, we would have no ability to know whether or not there's an equitable treatment for these women based on what they look like. I also highly recommend a book by Tanya Hernandez, a professor of law at um, Fordham University that talks about mixed race and civil rights law and what she finds by looking at cases of um, individuals who um, may be described in mixed race, they are not, their charges are not that I'm being discriminated against because I'm mixed race. They are saying I'm being discriminated against because of my street race, because of what people are seeing in front of them, right? So it really doesn't matter if you're mixed race, it's what people are assigning to your physical appearance and how they're treating you based on that assignment. So technically, all of us are mixed race, right? We can have a DNA test 
and find out we have ancestors from every part of this globe that walked all over this earth years ago. That's not telling you anything about how you're racialized. So I also mentioned that President Obama was chided for marking one box. And I think he did it simply because he understands these data are used to assess um, civil rights violations. And I don't think anyone would say that if Obama was walking down the street, that he would um, be seen as a white man, even though his mom was a white woman from Kansas and his father a black immigrant from Kenya. So um, again, when you look at these two mixed race um, women, who do you think is overrepresented in the school to prison pipeline? Who might be overrepresented in honors classes, AP classes, gifted classes? And why do you think it's important to answer that question as street race and mark only one box to, that most closely represents how you're racialized, right? Um, here are some of the outcomes that I've mentioned um, that are important for us to think about. These data are not simply about your identity, but they are used to look at inequities structured um, based on your, the assignments that people make to your physical appearance. Um, and think about ways that you can communicate the urgency of a complete count through your neighborhoods, through your employment, through your churches, um, through your, your networks of friends. And think of the most vulnerable, those who might be scared to fill it out the census um, and those who may not understand why it's so important. Here is um, just a, a sampling of some of the literature in not only sociology, but economics, political science, uh, public health, you name it, that documents that in Latinx communities in particular, but also we can apply it to almost all communities, there is a color line and that there's different poverty rates, different people live in different neighborhoods, right? People are exposed to different kinds of um, opportunities or disadvantages in the school system. Even when you commit the same crime, um, there's different sentencing, right? We know this. This is also happening um, in the Latinx community. And at the very bottom, I say, you know, the Census Bureau keeps confusing race and ethnicity, but do we have an ethical obligation to file a complaint with the um, Government Office of Accountability before the next research protocols for the 2030 census begin so that we argue that there's a waste of resources when we're doing testing of um, the question formats for Hispanic origin and race and there's not a single civil rights outcome that is tied to that testing. There's no question of, is this format going to help us enforce voting rights? <laughs> is this format gonna help us understand housing discrimination or violations of civil rights, criminal justice, et cetera, em um, employment and health? Um, and in the meantime, you do have the power to collect meaningful data that doesn't conflate ethnicity and race into one question and that actually educates the public about what these data are used for. So I often mention that um, at many of the talks that I give, people stand up and say, yeah, but my grandmother was black, my, um, or my great grandma was um, Native American, et cetera. And I wanna represent and honor that heritage. Well, that's very important. But at the same time, remember, that these data are helping us understand if your cousins who look very different from you might be experiencing something different than you who might not be experiencing that. In other words, one way of honoring is by saying, what is my street race for civil rights enforcement? And that on the American Community Survey, which is a 1% sample that happens every year, that's not the decennial census that only happens every 10 years, there is a separate ancestry question. But the purpose here is again for um, civil rights. So this is not happening in a vacuum. Um, as I mentioned before, I asked you to think about why the OMB standards that came out in the 70s originally and then were revised in the uh, late 90s kind of conflated race and color. In fact, the census had the word color in it until the 1960s, right? Um, and then it erased, it got erased, you know, by the 1970s, color didn't matter anymore. How is this part of the backlash that happened for civil rights enforcement? So um, here's a little timeline, a snapshot of how the census has been 
consulting with the communities impacted by violations in civil rights in the mid 70s. Um, there were national advisory committees that um, were separate. So there was one separate for Native Americans, separate for um, Black Americans, for Hispanic, to say, we know our communities, we know what the violations are, but guess what? 10 years ago, the Census Bureau decided we don't need that. We simply need to have, you know, one big um, national advisory, or this was eight years ago, sorry, in 2012, and 32 members, and they're all going to be making decisions, right? Um, it was telling that in, 19, in 2010, there was um, the alternative questionnaire experiment, and then in 2015, the um, national content test. And some of the formats they tested erased the word race. So not only was color erased in the 1970s, but now we're not even going to use the word race. It's offensive. We're post-racial. We don't want to use that, right? Um, it's also telling that not a single outcome was considered, and I mentioned that earlier. It's also telling that it dismissed all of the social science research that documents the difference between race and ethnicity. They're confused, right? Uh, because the people are confused, we're going to just call it the same thing. Um, it's also telling <laughs> that there was this attempt to add the the citizenship question, which was taken off. So I want to repeat that multiple times. There is no citizenship question, although there are attempts to keep testing it and include it for 2030. And again, you know, the, the travesty of linking an origin to a race box is very troubling. We know that this is happening in an era of dismantling of voting rights on a tax on data collection for fair housing. In fact, um, a few years ago, senators again in introduced this idea. We don't want to collect any race data for fair housing. We don't want that. Who needs that, right? Um, we also know that there have been numerous Supreme Court cases against um, the programs that are trying to integrate our schools, right? We also know that there's bills every year that are introduced to delete non-citizens from apportionment. So these are efforts that are part and parcel of a long history. This is not new. Um, we also know that we have the ability to resist, and I mentioned the Government Accountability Office and how we can file a complaint. So um, I want you to keep in mind that uh, these racialized inequities that are being observed here in the United States, especially in the Latino community, are not new. In fact, we know that and whether you're in Latin America, the Caribbean, or in Spain, there is uh, evidence that shows there's a color line that shapes your access to opportunities for um, Latino families. And ignoring that reality is not advancing equity, right? So I talk about um, white Latinx fragility, about the color line, right? People become very uncomfortable. So um, D'Angelo talks about white fragility, but the same dynamic is happening in our communities communities where 90% of enslaved Africans ended up in the Caribbean and in Latin America, right? And indigenous peoples have been surviving colonization for over 500 years. Privileged blinds. Oftentimes we don't want to talk about these things because they make us uncomfortable. But until we develop the strength and the ability to be self-critical and embrace the reality and, and talk about the inequities in our own families and our communities and in our nation, we are not going to get far. And data is a big part of that telling. Once you erase that data, you have very little ability to document and tell what's happening in the community. Um, this is just referring to an article that I did in the Latino Studies Journal, where I say, yes, most people, when they think about Hispanic, they think of a, a, a brown looking person but we know that anybody on this webinar could be Hispanic and we probably look pretty different, everything under the sun, right? Anyone in this picture could be Hispanic, right? But your treatment might vary on what you look like. So this other slide is interesting because it shows that um, even though the census claims that, oh, you know, 37% of Hispanics don't know what to mark, they mark some other race, that's not really true when you drill down because if you ask Cubans, 85% is a pretty high number. Most Cubans in this country identify as white. Um, compared to Dominicans, which is my um, ethnic background, only a third. So that, that, shares, that, that kind of shows there's a big difference here in terms of the way 
distinct national origins are answering the race question. For Puerto Rican and Mexican, it's about half that mark that they're white. And um, for South uh, Americans, it's about two thirds, right? But I also want to call your attention to the percent claiming that they are identifying racially as black, which just speaks volumes about the historic and contemporary anti-blackness within the Latinx community, because we know very well that in terms of people who are racialized as black, those numbers should be three or 10 times higher, right? Like they're not accurate. So thinking about why it is that um, the lack of this data helps us or, to, or is undermining our ability to advance health justice, our ability to advance educational justice, housing justice, environmental justice, all of that and how we can start changing the conversation and explaining what the use of these data are. I wanna note at the very bottom of this slide that it says that 13% of Hispanics leave that question blank. And if only they understood that again, with these numbers, we were able to document structured inequities that might map onto what, you know, are the, the Hispanics checking white living in the same neighborhoods? Are the Hispanics checking black or Native American is so small, I didn't even put it in here because it's even smaller than the numbers of black and it, it didn't fit. But if we change those numbers, if we had a category for brown, why isn't there a category for brown in the census when we know that there, is, there are hate crimes being visited on our brothers and sisters who may not be racialized as black as I am, but are racialized as brown? Why are we unable to capture that reality and document it so that we can dismantle that and eliminate it? So here's a picture that shows about um, only 1% of, of Latinos, people who say, yes, I'm Hispanic, say that they're native, indígena de las Américas. And, you know, why, who benefits when we don't capture the reality of many of the young children and families that are being kept in cages um, on the border um, are, are being racialized as Mexican, but really code word for brown, right? And so how do we capture that? We have to do a better job because otherwise we are participating in colorblind racism. Here. So in the meantime, does anyone have questions since um, there's a lot of information? I still want to talk about the health and the education research, but does anyone have any questions you can ask while I look for my PowerPoint? Sure. We did have one question. Uh, Jackie was asking if you could repeat the name of the author of the article that you mentioned, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. Sure, that is um, Tuck and Yang. And as uh, you mentioned, you will be having access to all of the references that I mentioned in, the, um, in your website, I suppose. Do you wanna put the name of the website where that will be available? Sure, if, you, um, if you'd just like to send me a link, then I can post that to the website um, following today's presentation. Perfect. Okay. Um, I don't know why I'm having such trouble finding my, um, my PowerPoint, even though I see it. Let's see if this is it. Yes, is this it? That's it. Okay, great. So now I am going to go page down and hope this doesn't happen again. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much, everybody, for your patience. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Lopez then. Okay. All right. So um, I'm sitting outside in my backyard because I hope I'll get better reception here. <laughs> uh, I was talking about this image, um, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and here is an example of the question that, as I mentioned, is included on the American Community Survey, but will not be on the 2020 census. But this could be seen as part and parcel of a racist racial project because it is a way of, of discouraging people from filling out the census. And we know that this is used for voting redistricting. It's used to distribute resources. It determines the number of representatives that go to um, not only the federal, um, to the Congress, but also to our state legislature and school boards, these numbers matter. So the idea that this suggestion was um, added at the last minute would um, discourage and create even bigger undercounts. This is um, an, a visual of the 
theory that I had mentioned earlier, racial formation theory, that really gets us to think about what level of race are you talking about? Are we talking about the social movements that are going on now against anti-Blackness and um, the ways in which that is manifested in terms of um, violence, structural violence in these communities? It also helps us understand that the decisions that are made in Supreme Courts, um, the ways in which representations happen in the mass media, as well as um, the movements that are organized to uh, fight back when there are injustices are part of uh, the social construction of race. It also encourages us to think about how this happens in our institutional policies and practices. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about the funding formula in the Department of Higher Ed. And then, of course, there's a dimension of race that, re that is related to how we might identify, how we experience that identity, and how we see the world based on that identity or cognition. So thinking about race as multiple levels, right? Um, and racial projects as definitions, interpretations, and representations of racial dynamics that are tied to the allocation of resources, such as um, the census. This is a controlling image of um, young men of color. And these young men um, were featured in a 1998 New York Times photo essay that claimed to be representing the diverse experiences of 13 year olds across the country. And of course, brown bodies, and these were uh, presumably, even though the word race was never mentioned, uh, Latino young men were entertaining themselves by being gang members. And you could imagine that white young men were represented as um, philant philanthropy folk that you know donate and, and volunteer or create their own businesses. The young white women were presented as um, frumpy academics or prom queens. And of course, uh, the brown Latina young women were represented as um, uh, just props for the real Latinos, just backdrops. And then um, the, the few black um, youth that were represented in this photo essay were represented as athletes that controlled their anger through sports. So think about how race, racial formation is being formed at, at the national level in the media, right? And how, what damage these controlling images do in terms of the public policies, right, that are, are um, shaped to, to um, address these controlling images. You all know Kamara Jones's work and her beautiful TEDx talk and just her incredible legacy and gift that she's given us in terms of understanding race at multiple levels, institutionalized, right? Practices and policies, but also personally mediated those things that are done by individual people, but also how it becomes internalized, how these images might become internalized. So think about ways in which you can name it, find a solution and then action, right? Um, become accountable to racism at, at all its levels. Anti-racism is a beautiful quote from Bonilla Silva, who talks about understanding institutional nature and recognizing that we're all located in these racialized systems. We're affected materially and ideologically by the racial structure. Um, he talks about colorblind racism. It's a very important pool, um, tool and how it, it provides a seemingly non-racial way of stating racial views without appearing racist. And it's a, an ideology that has become hegemonic and dominant since the 1960s, um, where uh, the status and the situation of um, racial and ethnic minorities is explained, not in terms of structural racism or institutional racism, but the individual failings of these communities or as natural occurring phenomena. So um, he does describe these four frames, abstract liberalism, you know, we're all in a meritocracy, you can all pick yourself up by your bootstrap. But a lot of this logic was used in framing the questions for the census the way that they were framed. Um, the minimization of racism obviously is part of the colorblind racism that's happening with the census when we are conflating ethnicity and race and origin as a though they're the same thing in tribal status or not. Um, the naturalization frame is probably the most prominent frame that is being used now and cultural racism to explain the disparities that we see 
in indigenous um, nations and in black and Latino communities in New York City where I'm from by saying, well, you know, that they are uh, experiencing this because of their um, behaviors and their life ways and, you know, they just don't eat right or it's just natural for them to be this way. So all of these frames, these ideologies, these narratives uphold policies and practices that are creating unjust situations. So now I'll switch gears and talk a little bit about the health research that I've done and sharing with you one of my colegas and co-author Edward Vargas who teaches at ASU crunched some numbers from us for the BRFIS, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey. And that survey was done about 18 years ago here in New Mexico, added this question that Kamara Jones created on, you know, how do others see you? Um, it, it was very similar and inspired my street race question, you know, socially defined race. And what you see here is fascinating because what it shows is that these are all people living in New Mexico who said, hey, if I identify as white, I believe others socially define me as white, but if they said multiracial, it was about 54%. If they said, I think my race is some other race, and we know research shows a lot of those are Hispanics, about a third said that I think others see me as white. Uh, for the Hispanic, it was 15%. For Native, it was only 6%. But if you said you were Black or Asian, none of them said, I think others see me as white. Why does that matter? Well, because we know that there is a difference in treatment, right, based on what you look like, whether you're seeking health care. This other um, question that was part of that survey, also here in New Mexico, asked how often do you think about your race? And again, um, Edward Vargas um, crunched these numbers, and he found that for Native Americans, it was almost half of them said all the time. For Blacks, a third of them said all the time. For Asians, same thing. For Hispanics, a quarter. And for whites, it was only 5%. So just sit with that and think about what that means, right? Are we collecting data on what that might mean? What is it that happens um, when we don't make these things visible? This one was asking about treatment at work. And as we see the color line right there, Blacks and Native were tied, Hispanics very close, Asian, and then 5% of whites. And then here saying, when seeking healthcare, do you feel your experiences were worse? Again, Blacks, Native, and Hispanic, in the predictable direction. Um, all these things. And then when we think about the impact those experiences, those lived experiences have on your mental health, on your physical health, all of those things matter, right? Like this question was not included, but it should be included. Within the past 30 days, have you felt emotionally upset, angry, sad, frustrated as a result of how you were treated based on your race? Whether you're seeking health care or whether you're at work, those are all social determinants. Racism is a pre-existing condition, right? Like these are all things that we have to think about. I know that we're short on time and um, I wanna make sure that we have time for uh, question and answer, but I'll just give you a small snapshot of some of the autoethnographic stories that I shared um, in my book, Mapping Race, Critical Approaches to Health Disparities Research, which was the product of uh, National Institutes of Health um, grant um, back in 2011-ish. And what I shared was that when I was a college student, I had the classic symptoms associated with gallstones. So I was probably 19 and for months did not receive adequate treatment. And the reason was that according to my doctor, I was not fat, fair, or 40. So I asked myself, how could it be that I was exhibiting all of these symptoms that were clearly, you know, the symptoms of having gallstones? And I ended up in an ER because it was not possible for that physician to see those symptoms and what I looked like in my age, et cetera, um, at the time and say, wow, you know, even though the textbook says that it's a, a white woman in her 40s or 50s that has gallstones, that I was not, um, I was not treated. Um, the same thing happened while I was expecting um, my children. I experienced um, different treatment based on what I look like in terms of um, accessing health care. Um, even as I was entering um, the building where I used to live, people would say, what are you doing here? You know, you have to ring the doorbell. You can't live here. Um, Others would say things like, well, um, you need to go fill out paternity papers because the automatic assumption was that I was not 
um, married. Um, and those assumptions weren't made of many of my colleagues who were um, expecting at the same time and in, you know delivering at the same time and then postpartum you know um, comments made about any kind of medical condition that it was due to an african gene all those things made me wonder what is being taught in medical schools or to health professionals about what race is right and the racialized gendered social determinants of health and how that treatment might result in disparities in health outcomes right um, I also think a lot about my um, cousin, labeled a boy at birth, also Black, Latino, Dominican, and um, by adulthood would be considered transgender, gender nonconforming, who is no longer with us, and what their social determinants of health look like were radically different from mine, right? And so intersectionality is something that is incredibly important for us to think about. How is it that race, gender, class, sexual orientation all converge, right, and create a unique set of experiences that might be shaping your health or health outcomes? I, I um, use this term in the uh, Mapping Race book, Racialized Social Determinants of Health, um, to refer to those experiences that you might have that are accumulating across the life, life course, right, and become embodied and result in disparities in health. Are we capturing data on that? Is it enough to simply say, how do you identify? Is it just enough to say, how do others see you? Or do we actually have to look at lived experiences, right? And how that might differ race, gender, class, sexual, um, sexuality. Uh, here's the question that was the basis of two research articles that were published using uh, nas the National Latino Health and Immigration Survey, which had about 1,500 um, Latinos. Um, and you know, this is what the question looked like. And of course, um, we found very big differences. So the first article was published in the Sociology of Race and Ethnicity Journal. Um, and it found major differences. Like one of the ones that stuck out in my mind was that if we simply used um, how do you identify, you know, which is what's usually used, instead of something like how are you um, identified by others, your street race, or what Kamara Jones calls socially defined race, then we would miss disparities in health outcomes like mental health. So we didn't find a relationship between how you, um, how you are seen by others in your physical health, but we did find mental health. So including that question, whether you're doing surveys or you're just collecting institutional data, might help you map um, some inequities that might remain invisible otherwise. Um, the other article that came out was in the Critical Public Health Journal. And again, my um, colega who, um, Edward Vargas is at ASU, we asked about everyday discrimination when you go shopping, when you access healthcare, when you go to the store, when you seek employment and so on. And of course we found that those Latinos who say, I think others on the street see me as brown or black, Arab, et cetera, were much more likely to report incidents of unfair treatment than those who said, I think on the street I'm seen as white. So why don't more studies um, collect more than one measure of race and why is it that we are not collecting this in our own institutional data, right? One measure of race is not enough. It's not enough to just ask how you identify. So I urge you to look at that. I also wanna invite you to submit something if you are doing research or have data that you'd like to share with us or even a, a theoretical piece. Um, I'm co-editing along with Jamal Martin, who was part of the speaker series earlier, um, a journal with other um, uh, authors, um, Jeffrey Long, who's a professor of anthropology here at UNM, and also uh, Luisa Borrell, who is uh, a health disparities researcher in New York, a special issue of genealogy that says, what's your street race? Cartographies and ontologies of race and the future of knowledge production on inequality, resistance, and social justice. So if we have um, colorblindness in our research and in our data collection at the federal, at the national level, we as practitioners, as scholars, as teachers, as community leaders and, and beyond have a responsibility to create data sets 
that capture these differences in a meaningful way so that we can rectify them, right? It's not enough to just do the report. What are we gonna do with the data? So now I'm gonna to turn to my final topic, which is how does our higher ed look like in the state with the highest percentage of Latinos and a critical mass of indigenous nations here? What are those historic and contemporary social structures, practices, ideologies, and narratives that shape inequalities in this, um, context. How can we leverage the richness of this community um, for catalyzing communities of practice for intersectional equity? I use this quote from one of my mentors book on framing dropouts. Her name is Michelle Fine. She's at the City University of New York. Um, and she uh, opens with this quote that says, data on unequal educational outcomes are typically withheld from public scrutiny. And that makes me think, why? Why is that? Why is it that um, we are not being told or not having access to data that shows inequities, right, in a complex way. So this beautiful definition of intersectionality comes from um, Collins and Bilge. And it says that when it comes from to social inequality, people's lives and the organization of power in a given society are better understood as being shaped not by a single axis of social division, be it race or gender or class, but by many axes that work together and influence each other, right? People use intersectionality as a tool to solve problems that they or others around them face. And I think that that's why I find this framework so compelling because it helps you understand where there's an inequity in a complex way and it helps you figure out how to address it. So I use this beautiful quote from the Columbia uh, River River Collective says that we must remain self-critical always, right? That we have to be committed to examining our own politics and being self-critical of ourselves in order to bring about social justice. I also use this slide to kind of help us locate ourselves in systems of inequity. I did not create, you know, um, class oppression or heterosexual oppression or racial oppression or colorism, right? or um, heterosexism, all those things, ableism, the ways in which um, we dehumanize people who um, may not uh, have immigration papers, all those systems existed before I was born, right? But I'm located within them. And how do I develop a practice that get, gets me to reflect on my location at, at the convergence of, of all those systems of inequality, right? How do we create a praxis of self-critical implicating intersectional justice? Um, here's another wonderful visual. If you haven't read Black Feminist Thought, I would urge you all to look at that book because it provides us another very important tool for understanding the matrix of domination, whether we are in Brazil, whether we are in Germany, or whether we are here in Nuevo Mexico. And part of the matrix involves understanding the um, ways in which settler colonialism is still present, the ways in which white supremacy is present, structural racism, anti-blackness, patriarchy, heterosexism, nativism. Those are all distinct systems of oppression that have a different history here than they might in Australia or in um, Canada. So what does that, system of oppression look like? And then within that system of oppression, how are organizations implicated? How are organizations managed? How can we be attentive to the interpersonal domain of power? How all of us have a consciousness and a lived experience. And then this outer circle um, around the matrix just shows the role of narratives, the role of ideologies, the roles of stories, what Patricia Hill Collins calls the hegemonic or cultural domain of power as the ideological glue that keeps all these systems in place. Um, whether again, we're talking about the United States or we are going to Southern Spain. So this tool helps us unpack that history and how it's implicated, all these power relations are implicated at all those levels. So the last um, article that I'll share with you comes from a publication in the Race, Ethnicity, and Education Journal. And it was one that I was fortunate enough to co-edit with colleagues in um, education. 
on critical race theory and quantitative research methods. And what um, I want you to know about this is that I'm very grateful to my colleague, Mar um, Melissa Binder, who is now the director of the Masters in Public Policy at UNM and runs a wonderful evaluation lab and summer institute, if any of you want to participate, and two of our students, Mario Chavez and um, Christopher Irwin, who did an enormous amount of work to um, get this article published. And what I want to share with you is the main finding, although there's a lot more I could share with you, I want to share with you a table that summarizes what we found when we looked at the odds of graduating at a public university that will remain nameless in the Southwest. Um, and we had over um, 6,400 people in the data set and, and we had nine years of data and we said, okay, if we compare everyone to high income white women in terms of their odds of graduating, what are the disparities by social location? Meaning when we compare them to low income white women, do we see a disparity? We did. We saw that um, compared to high income white women, low income white women were 14% less likely to graduate. But at the same time, when we compare to white low income men, it was 28% less likely to graduate. So we see a big difference there, right? What about Hispanic low income men? 24% less likely to graduate. What about black high income women? Well, they were also 23% less likely to graduate. What about Native American low income women? They were 40% less likely to graduate. So I could look at these numbers and say, well, there's something genetically wrong with these social categories or well, they're lazy, they don't wanna work hard, they don't deserve you know, to go to the university. But instead, with an intersectional lens, I would say, wait a minute, these are all high school graduates from schools in the state. What structural inequities existed in this state that might have shaped these outcomes, right? And how is it that now knowing this data, we can create accountability, ethical accountability, institutional accountability, for eliminating all of these inequities, including for all of the other groups that are not represented. I wanna call your attention to two things that surprised us. What we found was that American, um, I'm sorry, that Hispanic high income women and Asian high income women had zero differences with white high income women. And it would be tempting to say, well, that means that they have the same experience. No, these data just show they have the same outcome. That does not mean that their lived race gender is identical. It does not mean that their experiences with sexism, racism, uh, he uh, heterosexism, and ableism was the same. What it just shows is that in the odds of graduating, there were no differences over that nine year data set. So I, I want you to think about what intersectional analysis makes visible and why it's insufficient to continue reporting outcomes, whether it's health outcomes or educational outcomes, by simply saying, oh, this is the outcome for this group by race alone, or this is the outcome by income alone, or this is the outcome by gender alone. That's important information, but it's not enough. We need to dig deeper if we are trying to address and advance equity for all. So I will share this um, one of my last slides because now we only have maybe 15, 20 minutes to talk. And this is really um, a way of capturing how the New Mexico funding formula currently for institutions of higher eds uh, is, needs to revisit their definition of what at risk is. Currently, the practice is that Pell status, whether a student qualifies for Pell status or federal aid is the best way to identify and serve um, at-risk students. You know, Pell eligible students graduate at low risk. So why, since there's so many, you know, low income kids of color, that's addressing the race gap. Well, it's not. And I want us to think about why using class alone is insufficient, as you can see from the data that I shared earlier. So an alternative to that would be to say, well, what if we created a funding formula that uses 
intersectionality and says, race, gender, and class as overlapping social locations is necessary for identifying at-risk students. And, and the narrative instead becomes using Pell status alone is not enough. We need to include race, gender, and income in our analysis of inequities as solutions, right? That another way to capture class is not only income, but parental educational attainment. If we were to find out, you know, are you the first in your family to graduate high school versus someone who is, you know, the third person in their family to get a college degree, that might be data that might help us understand these uh, inequities and address them. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to go over this only to say that we need to be careful with the deficit oriented language that we use to talk about racial and ethnic minorities communities and instead talk about the cultural wealth and the, uh, what um, you also talks about the cultural capital, language capital, navigational, linguistic, familial, and um, what my um, colleagues and I students are working on a chapter called transformational intersectional capital to talk about the experiences of ethnic studies teachers and what is happening. Why is ethnic studies directly linked with reductions in inequality for all youth, but particularly for those that have traditionally not been served by our um, K-12 uh, school system and, and so on. Um, here is a beautiful email I received unsolicited when I gave a similar talk in another venue, and it's, it's coming from a woman who identifies herself as Latina. And she says, Dr. Lopez, I attended that conference and I enjoyed the street race lecture as someone whose street race is white, but has a grandmother who immigrated from, and she gave the, num the name of a country. It made me think a lot about my own journey in understanding my relationship to race and ethnicity. It's something that I'm beginning to grapple with and has caused me a fair amount of discomfort as well as excitement. I wonder if you had any books or recommendations for someone who's beginning to explore these issues. And to me, what this shows is humility. It shows courage. It shows a willingness to say, I'm not gonna be insulted and angry about this lecture because you're saying that I'm not Hispanic because when I walk down the street, I look white. Well, that's ludicrous, right? Of course she's Hispanic, but that she's understanding that her experience might be different because of the color of her skin than maybe her cousins who are brown or black or something else who may not that that is one way for her to understand is there an injustice happening and what is my role in fixing that injustice so that is something that i found really really powerful this is a visual that again shows why it's not enough to just simply capture how you identify or how others see you but that we have to also think about what is that person's um individual collective narrative about who they are, who they are connected to, what are their ethical and political values, those are not all the same thing. So when going back to the census, a lot of people say, well, my, you know, I want to, I want to honor the heritage of my ancestors, that's important. But for the purposes of looking at civil rights outcome, I hope everyone understands why it's important to answer that race question by marking one box and making it a box that counts for the civil rights use. Um, losing self-reflexivity represents a sure sign that one is beginning to sell out. That comes out from Patricia Hill Collins' Fighting Words, Black Women and the Search for Justice. Here, another visual that shows why zip code is not enough. This is the neighborhood I grew up in, in New York, which was a public housing project on the right, across the street from a very elite and um, very wealthy um, co-op where let's just say the health outcomes look very different, the educational outcomes, the wealth profile. And it wasn't until I graduated high school in the mid 80s that there was a lawsuit because there was documented racial discrimination against visual, visible minorities. Um, I also wanna call your attention to that question I posed at the beginning of our conversation that said, what are the limits of simply using um, zip code, a colorblind approach to dealing with racialized inequities um, in, in um, college admissions, that the zip code is not enough. It wouldn't capture that. And I've seen that here in Albuquerque too. Across the street, there could be a $500,000 house and the trailer um, you know, uh, community right next to it. Zip code is not enough, right? 
Um, let's see. So next steps, how will you develop and deepen your intersectionality lens in New Mexico communities um, via your policies and practices? What about for the census? What about in your research, teaching, community organizing? What will you do to improve the data infrastructure in your spheres of influence? I want to mention that we do have this um, New Mexico statewide race, gender, class data policy consortium and that we have created the ability to um, capture um, parental educational attainment for all of our incoming students, except for graduate students. We're still working on that. Um, these are some of the activities. I invite you to join the listserv for the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Justice at the University of New Mexico by going to race.unm.edu and um, page down, connect now, and you can add yourself. Um, the importance of having collective spaces where people from multiple disciplines are coming to talk, whether you're in health, in law, in anthropology, in Chicano studies, Africana studies, Native American studies, sociology like me, about how we're thinking about race, how we're doing research on it, and how this research can help inform better policy. I want to point out, I will be teaching a course this fall um, as a online course on intersectionality, race, gender, class for social policy. So the dates are gonna be the 20, uh, 21st of December through the um, 16th of January. If you want more information, email me at nlopez at unm.edu. Um, we, we do have a graduate certificate on race and social justice and an undergraduate certificate, so I invite you to apply to that. This is the group that got together to do the National Institutes of Health um, funded workshop that resulted in a book um, that brought in, you know, biological anthropology. There's Kamara Jones in the bottom in the gray suit. Um, just amazing, wonderful community to talk about these issues um, that we hope makes a difference. And um, yeah, I think I will end here because now I only have 10 minutes, I think. And I apologize for the disruption earlier. Thank okay. you. Thanks so much, Dr. Lopez. Uh, now we will move into the Q&A portion of the presentation. We do have quite a few questions for you. Uh, the first two are actually um, uh, regarding street race. So the first person says, I'm slightly confused. Isn't my street race determined by others? Yes, that's the point. So remember um, when I talked about when, and I showed that visual, of the three men that are Latino, but the data show that when each of these men show up to look for an apartment, they will be treated on what they look like. So if the purpose of the data collection for the census is civil rights enforcement for voting rights, fair housing, all of that, what, what if all of them checked five boxes and said, yeah, I have ancestors from Spain, from Africa, from Native, uh, Asia, you name it we would not have the ability to document that and mitigate that and, and fix it. So yes, it is determined by others. Race is a social construction. It has nothing to do with your DNA. Okay. The second question is, if my street race is determined not by myself, but, what, uh, but is what determines my treatment in regards to social justice, then what does that mean in terms of what boxes I should check? Again, um, it's the people, the biggest critique I've received about street races is as well, it changes. I could be in Hawaii and it's going to be something else. And I could be in the Dominican Republic where my family came from, and it could be something also in Brazil. And Kamara Jones has a beautiful story about that. Um, I think you've seen it in The Gardener's Tale. And she says, look, I could be in Brazil. I could be in the United States. I could be in South Africa. My GNA hasn't changed, my color hasn't changed, what I look like hasn't changed, but my social status has changed. And because of that, the outcomes, even like the birth weights of her children, her longevity, her access to educate, all of that will change. And that's the beauty. So answer that question as if though you're answering it for civil rights and equity use. I think that's called ethical accuracy. Now, is it important for me to understand the way you identify? Of course it is. Is it important for me to understand your ancestry, et cetera? Of course that is. But again, the use of the census is, is very specific. It is for civil rights enforcement for all those outcomes we care about. 
So what I would urge everyone to do if you're doing surveys is please consider including more than one measure and being clear about what you're collecting. Because it is very tempting in all of us. I, I guarantee you, we take a DNA test, we'll find lots of that we had ancestors that walked all over. But if the data continually say you're being treated based on what you look like, then it's very important that we think about how that data will be used to advance justice. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Benny, and it is, do you believe that Mestiyahe, the unwillingness to accept the existence of indigenous culture in favor of European culture in the Americas continues to be a problem? How, would, uh, how do you address this complex issue, especially when there is so much denial that it exists as an issue in the Americas? It's huge. I absolutely agree that that's huge. And I think part of it is going to be changing our K through 12 um, teaching. I mentioned ethnic studies. And I feel very sad to say that I went to New York City public schools my whole life. And it wasn't until I was in college that I got to read anything about Dominican history, culture, the history of, you know, colonization, the decimation. And what was beautiful was by the late 1990s, when I was doing research for my book, Hopeful Girls, Trouble Boys, Race and Gender Disparity in Urban Ed, and I was doing field work in one of the local high schools, one of the teachers who was not herself Dominican, and most of her kids were um, Dominican students, made it a point to take her students, and there was no funding, I mean, this was a, highly, a very poor school, to the American Indian Museum near Ground Zero to say, we, I know this is not on the Regents. The Regents is like our statewide exam in order to graduate, but this is important information that you need to know. And it helps students develop what Patricia Hill Collins calls flexible solidarity, which is they were very anchored in their reality, but they were also able to understand and see the connections, right? And understand, wow, in the Dominican Republic where my family's from, there were indigenous people, what happened, right? Um, and then there was the enslavement of Africans. What, how is that, how am I related to that? So we really do need to combat anti-blackness, anti-indigeneity in our communities. And a big place to do that is in K-12 education. Critical race, intersectional ethnic studies. That's happening across the country. 20 states already have it, including our own. But in most cases, it's an elective rather than a requirement for all of our students and teachers for credentialing. Thank you. Heidi asks, as an epidemiologist, I am often asked to present and interpret health data by race and ethnicity. Due to small sample sizes for New Mexico, I am often stuck with three categories, white, non-Hispanic, Hispanic, and other. Is there a better way to think about presenting this data and what resources would you recommend? I would say this is why I started the consortium, which is to try to change the way the data are collected. It's insufficient. You're absolutely right. People of color are being lumped sometimes. I've seen it a lot of studies. Oh, people of color. Are you talking about someone who's racialized as Asian? And we talked about the anti-blackness. There's anti-indigeneity or uh, anti-native brown looking people who are being attacked because they look native, Navajo, and Asian, right? Chinese. So we have to find a way to collect it better. So that's a long haul. But in the interim, find a way that you could disaggregate groups, even though the numbers are small, you might not be able to do an enormous amount of um, like a logistic regression or, or some analytical technique, but it could make that experience visible and actionable for equity and justice. So I, I want to encourage all of you, if you ever have any questions, email me. Um, I can give you some more specifics, but one thing is changing the infrastructure. The root problem is the way the data are collected and the miscommunication to the patients and the people about what's gonna be done with that data. Okay. Um, then we have a question from Neelam who um, self-identified as Asian and said, I am still thinking a lot how to practice diversity in real life than literature despite attaining a good position. I have been facing great derogatory at my workplace. Instead, labeling people of color, isn't it fair to say all lives matter probably then we will be able to diminish the term racism as its impact? That's a beautiful, and thank you for that comment. It reminds me of um, the quote that I shared earlier from Bonilla Silva, that being anti-racist means that we can't be colorblind. 
and I, I don't know if I'm going to find it right now, but basically, yeah, here it is. So there is a hope that if we stop talking about race, like if we stop talking about patriarchy, if we start talking about racialized capitalism, that'll go away. But the reality is until we confront the elephant in the room, we are not going to be able to address it. So although it's tempting to say, and actually the American Anthropological Association wrote a letter to the Office of Management and Budget in the late 90s, uh, a memo saying, please, you know, we know that race isn't biologically real. Let's just stop talking about it. But the American Sociological Association in 2003 wrote a, a statement, 13 pages, saying, actually, even though race is not biological, it's socially real. And for us to say, we're going to stop collecting gender data because we know that there's um, that gender data collection contributes to ongoing thinking about gender and not realize that we have a sex gender system that treats men very differently than women. And when you map race onto that in a racialized way, right, does, does not make that system go away. So we have to confront race in order to dismantle it. We can't be colorblind. And I apologize, but I do have another meeting in a minute. <laughs> so okay. I'm so sorry. Is there one very tiny question? We have, we have one last question. Uh, Neelam also asked, what about the discrimination among races slash ethnicity, not only by whites, we assume? Absolutely. And in fact, I encourage you to look at Land of the Cosmic Race by Christina Su. She's a sociologist that went to Veracruz, Mexico. And, I, and she came to give a talk at UNM and I said, you could have gone to the Dominican Republic, done the same study. There is massive discrimination happening, especially in the sending communities, because that's where the enslavement of Africans began, right? Before the United States and even here in the United States. So that's part of what Kamara Jones refers to as internalized racism. It happens in families, right? Um, Christina Sue talks about the everyday wounds of color that are part and parcel of the ways in which um, there is interpersonal racism happening, even within the family. We have to deal with that. And I thank you for that question. But we can't lose sight of the fact that there is no history of folks of color in this country or in other countries having structural power for not years, but generations and centuries, right? But there is a history of white supremacy in all of those countries that I mentioned. So yes, we have to deal with internalized racism and racism that happens among people of color without a doubt, but we also have to step back and say structurally, um, communities of color have never been in um, a political power for hundreds of years and implemented entire systems based on white supremacy. We have to be cognizant that there, there is a structural difference there. We have to address them at all levels. So thank you for that wonderful question and for this beautiful dialogue and for having the courage to continue this work. And Neelam said, appreciate your kind response. Um, and I know you've got to go. So I'll just say thank you, Dr. Lopez, for your time and your expertise today. We appreciate all of your efforts towards helping us create an equi equitable New Mexico. And email. thank you to Go ahead. <laughs> we'll share your email address on the website as well. And thanks Thank everyone else for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you back next week as Dr. Melissa Riley and Rachel Lorenzo from Indigenous Women Rising present a Native American social and community context to understanding public health. Have a great afternoon, everyone.